Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat number 97, featuring the third and final segment of my interview with Star Control creators Paul Ritchie III and Fred Ford. In this segment of the interview, we'll talk about uh, Abandonware, full motion video, we'll hear about their game The Horde, and of course, their thoughts and plans for Star Control 4. I know you've been waiting to, to hear about that. Got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Fred Ford and Paul Ritchie. Uh, how do you feel about all of your, all of the abandonware, uh, all these abandonware sites and people, uh, you know, making uh, mail order monster ROMs for free, and this is an example. Uh, do you resent that, or do you not care, or do you actually like it? Um, you know, as so long as people are doing it out of love and affection and for all the good reasons, I think we really like it. Um, I may be violating contracts with previous publishers by saying that because they're probably still in effect, but, you know, we don't have a way to sell mail-order monsters now. Evan, Evan and Nikki, we don't. Um, so if we want it to still make people happy, then, then someone else is going to have to do that. So, I mean, and that's as, if someone decided to do mail-order monsters too, and, you know, they wanted to make millions of dollars off it, and we weren't involved in that, we'd probably get a little snarky. But I think, in general, we want people to enjoy our you know, creative work, and, and we do it to make people happy. So that's really what drives anything else. And the pizza. Yeah, send pizza. So send pizza. <laughs> Instead of a pizza, a pizza contribution fund, maybe, for to I think I owe uh, Eric the conscious Bert. of uh, <laughs> those abandonware sites. <laughs> so, I mean, like, I wanted to play, uh, oh, XCOM lately. And, you know, it turned out the version, I ended up getting a version off of Steam and it worked just fine. But initially I was having a heck of a time getting any of the DOS emulators to run the version of XCOM, you know, the, the, the version that I had. Uh, so I was really happy to find that, that Steam had, was offering it again. And I played, there's an open source sort of remake of a game very much like it. And it was high res and, and entertaining, but I actually went back and played the original and it was a much stronger experience, as, as low res as it was. Um, it was just a great piece of art. And I think you can say the same things about games like the Masters of Orion. And, you know, Monkey Island has been revived and brought back. But still, that original EGA version of Monkey Island is a, a great product and worth playing by itself. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> really talk, brilliant. Now let's talk about the 90s era. You know, I want to make sure we have a, you know, we cover this, too. This was, uh, I guess, the Horde was the... I don't have the year written down for the Horde. I guess that 93, was 93. Yeah. But that was a, a 3DO game with a full motion video, and I believe Kirk Cameron was in it. <laughs> you know, how do you feel about yep. that game now? Oh, good, I think. Uh, it was a cleansing of the palate after Star Control 2. Uh, Accolade turned, turned to us after we had finished Star Control 2 and after not having paid us for six months and said, hey, why don't you do Star Control 3 for the same amount of money we gave you on Star Control 2? And we said, well, that didn't really reach the end of Star Control 2. So, and we're, we'd like to actually try something a little different uh, for at least one iteration. And so that's kind of how the Horde was born. And we had created it um, entirely on the PC um, as the, the game experience in terms of, you know, building up your town and protecting your cows that return to cattle ranching roots. And then there was this, wow, well, we're going to move it to the 3DO, so, hey, live action video. And <laughs> so we thought, well, cool. We've never made a movie before. Let's, let's try that. So we took a stab at writing the script, and then it got rewritten, and it got really, really long, and then it got cut really back, and it just got crazy. So pretty much the humor was the part that came through. And I think I can share this story. So casting became, like for the first time, the casting issue came up. And um, the head of uh, the company at the time was a very famous executive who had just joined the company from the film industry. And he's walking by, he was very busy, walking by to his car. And he's like, Paul, who's for the role for Chauncey? And I'm like, Martin Short? And he's like, mm, box office poison, please rethink. <laughs> and so that was the end of that conversation. And we kept finding people who really wanted, who had just gotten super famous and wouldn't talk with us. And, and finally, what we connected with was that we really didn't need this, this star. We needed the right character, this sort of authentic, 
nice guy that you could root for. And Kirk Cameron really was kind of perfect for that. And, uh, you know, I think I look back at that and it, it achieves, I think, all the things I want to do. I mean, you know, you, Kirk, Kirk's got his life now for, for whatever he's doing. But I, I think we actually had a couple of people at Crystal Dynamics say that they got into the game industry and wanted to join Crystal because it was such a weird and different game <laughs> that they wanted to see who on earth made this. So I, I still love it quite a bit. You know, I probably have viewers that have never heard of the 3DO. You know, I have no idea what we're talking about, a full motion video even. Uh, what do you think happened to, why is it a, why didn't full motion video continue? You mean as, as like the CD-ROM games right, that were right. just pretty with, much? Yeah. With all the live actors and the video clips and everything. It's hard to tell an interactive story that way. Um, you pretty much get what you filmed, and, and sure, you can do the the dragon. What was that dragon? Dragon's lair. Dragon's lair approach of uh, punctuated moments where you switch to a different track. But it's um, I think part of it had to do with the, the hardware chase. You know, we're <clears throat> we're starting out with you know four colors on the IBM, and then sixteen, and then two hundred fifty six, and. So and then we started to be able to animate faster and faster. And so people can just like jump ahead, right? And say, well, what you really want to do is make a movie. That's what you're headed. Now, of course, that wasn't us. <laughs> and there's a whole lot of people who go, well, wow, if they're making a movie in games where all this money is, hey, we can get involved. So let's, let's do the Hollywood production. And so we sort of got taken off track a little bit. Um, and then thankfully, you know, there's games that synthesize their graphics and they're now getting closer and closer to film. I think Call of Duty does an excellent example of having an interactive game which transitions to a very film-like experience. But really, the core fun is all happening in the gameplay. I mean, we always, when we're budgeting, you know, doing cinematics, whether they're in-game, IGCs, or FMVs, full motion videos, we know that if we ever bore you, you're just going to click through it. And, you know, so like, oh, that was $150,000. They just clicked through it. <laughs> so from our perspective, we're very reticent to spend big money on that stuff, uh, if it's our money, and even if it's Activision's. And so when we make it, we want to make sure that there aren't those click moments in the middle where it sort of dies and we know that, you know, a million people just clicked right past it. I wanted to, to skip ahead a little bit here. I don't know how you guys are for time, but uh, I definitely wanted to get to some of these these questions about a little witching mischiefs. Is that how you say that? Mis <laughs> mischiefs? Mischiefs? Yeah. <laughs> I, mischiefs is pretty good. Mischiefs? We actually have never mischiefs. heard that word spoken out loud by the people who published it, so we don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I wanted to ask you about little witching mischiefs <laughs> or mischiefs we're not uh, quite sure this was a, Jap <laughs> a japanese game from bondi and i don't you know i haven't talked to a lot of uh, designers who have worked with the, the japanese audience you know so i was wondering what you thought was did you notice any big differences between uh, the games you've been working on before and this this new audience you know how does how did the jap how does the uh, japanese market compare to the american market wow i think you're way overestimating our competence <laughs> answering that question <laughs> Um, Just how that project came to be is an interesting story. <laughs> the, uh, we had created the Unholy War, and we liked the way the combat worked out. We had a much more involved uh, strategy uh, story experience that got cut at the last minute. So we really felt there was like this unresolved potential there. And uh, our, we, we had been playing these games called the SD Gundam, which were very much like Advance Wars back a while. And we thought, wow. We have a game where we could, uh, instead of just meeting and watching a canned resolution of combat, you could actually go into battle with these robots. We know how to do that. So let's go get that license and let's do that. And um, our president of our company at the time said, hey, I know people at Bondi. I can make that happen. And we're like, oh, wow, this is awesome. And the message that we got back was Bondi loves Unholy War. They think it's a great idea. But you know what? They have an even bigger license, like huge and we're like, well, what could it be? So the contract was signed <laughs> before we knew what we were making. And, and all we knew is the fax was going to start churning out the images. And so sure enough, the fax starts going and we can see the Japanese kanji header and like, here it comes. And it's like this girl from the 60s with a magical makeup kit. And we're like, what? <laughs> and they just kept coming and coming and coming. And 
it's, it's hard to understand, but it was a retrospective nostalgia piece which combined your favorite witch girl characters from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, which I guess is sort of like we've got Scooby-Doo or we've got this collection of, you know, cartoon characters like Johnny Quest, but theirs are these girls who were born in another dimension where they're a princess. They have magic powers, but for some reason they were sent to our world, and the only way they can evoke their powers is through their makeup or some little object, which then a toy gets made and sold to them in the real world. So we got these really actually pretty great design docs for level design. Um, it's just that we couldn't read them because they were all in Japanese. And the only person who spoke English on the Bondi side quit. And so for a long time when we're finishing this game, we're exchanging in a language that neither of us entirely under, they don't understand our English, we don't understand their Japanese. Greg Johnson comes back in again as his wife Eriko is a native Japanese speaker. So she would come over from time to time and sort of clue us in on what they're talking about. And then at the very end, and for you game developers out there, you'll appreciate that the bugs towards the end of a development cycle, particularly on a console, get really technical. You know, The player is unplugging the joystick while yanking the memory card in and out and opening the disk box. And you have to sort of, even in English, really, what are they talking about? And we would just get the facts, we'd just start rolling in Japanese with these bug reports, and eventually we just shut the facts off. <laughs> that was sort of the end of the development of that game. It's like, we think it's good enough, and we're not talking anymore. <laughs> and it came out, and we've got a couple of copies of it, and we've got some little toys that came out, because it was a rollout of this whole large brand. But it's definitely the weirdest game development experience we've ever had. We've never met one person who's played it. So if you're out there and you played it, let us know how it was. Uh, we were talking a little bit uh, uh, before about doing games for kids. You know, I was thinking when I was a kid, I was, you know, playing Archon and Mail Order Monsters. I don't know if those were specifically designed for kids. I mean, what is it like trying to design a game specifically for kids? Um, well, there's always a risk of condescending, and that's the worst thing you can do. Kids are extremely smart they learn faster than we old people do. Um, their vocabulary, both in, in language and symbolically, isn't as complete. Uh, so you have to be careful about using references or shortcuts that with a teenager you might, they might understand. So because um, young kids don't have the vocabulary necessary to understand concepts where you might just sort of throw out like the horror of war. Well, young kids don't necessarily know what that means. So you can use the same concept. Maybe that's an inappropriate concept with little kids, but you would just need to communicate it in a different way. So really what it comes down to is the core experience needs to be fun and compelling at least as, at least as much as a game for adults because of, you know, kids are notoriously impatient with boring stuff as well they should be. So it focuses you on getting to the, the good stuff fast it makes you not rely on bizarre vocabulary, uh, both in text and symbolically. And you need a pretty fast feedback loop. And then there's the ratings issues. So, for example, on Madagascar 1, they really wanted it to be an E-rated game. But it became E-10 because Gloria had a butt bounce. And we didn't really want to change its name because clearly she was bouncing on people with her butt. But because we used the word butt, it became an E-10 game. <laughs> And it's amazing. I think we spent hours arguing about Gloria's butt. I mean, what a job when you get to argue about a theoretical hippo butt. All right, so this is what my favorite question, I think, is uh, was submitted from uh, Cameron <laughs> Goebel, a.k.a. Longtail Gamer. And he wants to know about Star Control 3, which you have promised us. <laughs> so how much of Star Control 2 uh, will you bring back in that game, and, and how much will be brand new? Mm, and first off, I would not call it Star Control 3, as that will be confusing. Let's call it Star Control Returns, or something along those lines. Um, wow, Cameron, nice question. We'll get to you later. Um, the, uh, I think that there needs to be enough there, so that when you enter the experience, it feels like a fairly continuous moment from the last game. I mean, 20 or 25 years may end up passing between them. But I don't think that we're like saying generations later in an entirely different area of space with all new ships. I mean, that, that's not why people are going to 
play this game. I mean, this isn't a game that we would be selling for the same reasons that we would sell a first-person shooter. This would be a game for people who like Star Control 2 and who wanted to continue that experience. So I think we'd pick up pretty close to where the story ends and keep enough of the races and ships that you felt familiar and then introduce as the game goes on the new races. And so, gosh, percentage-wise, I'm not sure. Um, you know, 50-50 wouldn't be unreasonable, but given how little we've actually got dot on this, I, I think it's just a crazy guess. But I, there's, I still want to know what the Druze are up to. I mean, our technology has changed so much since that time that the game has to reflect the fact that people are walking around with way more advanced computers in their hands than we imagined people owning 200 years from now. So you have to sort of, and you know, the whole issue about like how movies would be different 15 years ago if people had cell phones, you know, entire movie plots would just start falling apart. So I think we'll have to reflect the change in our understanding of technology and, um, and also just try to bring in, you know, if there's any sort of uh, part of what we wrote Star Control 2's fiction on is what really pisses us off about this modern world we're living in. So, you know, it's, oh, it's intolerance, um, you know, people being unnecessarily warlike, uh, people being abandoned. And so I think we would look today and say, you know, well, hmm, what are we really pissed off about? You know, is it the price of gas? Is it political parties? Is it, you know, the earth revolting upon us? I'm, I'm not, not sure. So, Cameron, I hope that answered your question. All right. Uh, one, this is kind of a silly question, but I heard you mention alcohol a few times uh, last night. I was wondering if you had a favorite brew. <laughs> well, that immediately moves us to an M-rated <laughs> show, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> there are plenty of good people in this world who have done without alcohol. Uh, I'm not one of them, um, but I'm a notorious lightweight. Um, my rule is one drink, one drink consumed quickly. Uh, that pretty much makes me happy for the whole night. Uh, I tend to like really fruity, sweet drinks. So I like to go into a bar and manfully order a zombie or a Mai Tai. Uh, although I do like flavorful beers. How about you, Fred? Yeah, beer beer is always an easy one. Um, I'm not so much a sweet drink guy. Martini? I'll drink a martini. We went to this fancy New York restaurant when we were uh, launching the Skylanders at the toy show. And we went to this restaurant called WD-50, which is a molecular gastronomy restaurant. Uh, my daughter's a big foodie. And I decided, well, they're going to have weird food. Like, literally, they had cuttlefish and root beer sauce. Didn't eat that. But I wanted to order the weirdest drink I could get. And it turns out that the weirdest drink you can get is not good. Um, I felt obligated to consume it. But it was a combination of, like lavender, lavender, and oh God, some other very flowery flavor. And I like sweet drinks, but even, even that I had a hard time with. But the rest of their food was quite good. So WDD50, you can send us a free dinner coupon. <laughs> <laughs> good product, please. So do you, have a fa do you have a favorite beer or ale? Well, there's some pretty good uh, breweries here. Um, so we usually get uh, like uh, local IPAs. Yeah, there's Lagunitas. Um, Lagunitas IPA. Um, we had a couple of um, people are brewing their own here. And, you know, my own experiments in that made horrible tasting beer. But actually some people here, I don't know if they're like washing their stuff better than I did, but it's really quite drinkable. <laughs> All right, guys, that's been a lot of fun. I'm really, really thank you for taking the time to, to chat with me. Is there anything else that you want to add that we didn't cover? Besides stay in school and don't do drugs? I don't know. Have a good time. Yeah. Cut each other some slack. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be here again in a few a few more years. We'll, we'll still be doing this and you'll still be doing that. But we'll hopefully be talking about how much people love the new Star Control. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. We appreciate the time. The honor was all mine. Thank you very much. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. If you did, uh, please take a moment to click on the thumbs up or like button. I've actually been told that that uh, does make a significant difference in the number of views that a video gets, so we'd really appreciate that. Also want to uh, offer a toast this week. Uh, my toast will be to Adam Gladkowski, a Canadian fan who has recommended that I try this 
a lovely uh, Montreal stout, the uh, Saint Amboise. And I got to say, this looks so good. It's all I can do not to pop the lid on it and fill the old drinking horn right now. But I will try my best <laughs> to wait until after I'm done producing this video for you. Now, if you'd like to donate to the show, uh, you can do that. I'll, put, I'll post a link on the show notes, or you can visit us at armchairarcade.com. Love to have you there. Now, uh, Fred Ford and Paul Ritchie did end up sending me their list of recommended science fiction authors, and I've uh, posted that at armchairarcade.com. And the quotation uh, this week comes from one of those authors, uh, David Brin. And it goes something like this. My first duty is to write a gripping yarn. Second is to convey credible characters who make you feel what they feel. Only third comes the idea. Profound thought. It's good for novels, but I think also for game design. So I hope you guys enjoy that, and see you next week. Nerd.